Hi, my name is Muna Kangsin. I am Interim Communications Manager for the Cambridge Public Library. On behalf of our administration and staff, I welcome you to this event with uh, my Professor Martin Espada, one of my all-time favorite poets. Um, I should remind you before I introduce Professor Espada that there are some books for sale out there. Professor Espada is going to sign some, uh, uh, some books after the event, so if you haven't gotten a copy yet, uh, please do so right after the event. Uh, Martin Espada was born in Brooklyn, New York. His latest collection of poems from Norton is called Vivas to Those Who Failed. Other books of poems include The Trouble Ball, 2011, The Republic of Poetry, 2006, Alabanza, 2003, Imagine the Angels of Bread, and The Rebellion is the Circle of a Lover's Hand in 1990. Professor Espada has received the Ruth Lilly, the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, the Robert C. Creeley Award, the National Hispanic Cultural Center Literary Award, the Penn Refson Fellowship, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. The Republic of Poetry, please. The Republic of Poetry was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His book of essays, Zapata's Disciple, published in 1998, was banned in Tucson as part of the Mexican-American Studies Program outlawed by the state of Arizona and has been issued in a new edition by Northwest Uni Northwestern University Press. A former tenant lawyer in the Latino community of Greater Boston, Professor Espada is a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Espada to the Cambridge Public Library. Um, thank you, Mona, for that introduction and for uh, organizing this reading uh, this evening. Welcome, everyone. Um, very glad to be here, very relieved that I got back on the stage because there are no stairs. Oh, oh you just noticed, yes. So that was my uh, first feat um, of athleticism this evening, but not my last. Um, I was um, sitting out at the book table uh, greeting people individually as if I were running for city council. <laughs> and I, I met uh, someone who said, I've been teaching your work for years, and uh, the poem Alabanza in particular, uh, and um, students have been uh, using that poem to write uh, their own. And I've been thinking about that poem because uh, 17 years. 17 years uh, since 9-11. And now there are places I go, schools, um, even colleges and universities where the people I'm speaking to have no memory of what happened. All the more reason for us to keep talking about it and keep it from turning into yet another patriotic holiday with a profusion of flags so um, this is a poem, the meaning of which has changed for me over the years since I wrote it, since 9-11. Uh, the word alabanza, of course, means praise in Spanish. Um, and the title of the poem refers to the labor union uh, to which uh, certain workers belong. They were um, members of hotel employees and restaurant employees, Local 100. Uh, and, uh, they were killed that day at a restaurant called Windows on the World. Um, most of them immigrant and most of them, in fact, undocumented. Invisible in life, even more invisible in death, which is why I wrote the poem, to make the invisible visible. Um, so, um, I'm beginning with this poem tonight. Um, Beginning with one anniversary, at the end of the reading, I'll close with another anniversary. Alabanza in praise of Local 100 for the 43 members of hotel employees and restaurant employees, Local 100, working at the Windows on the World restaurant who lost their lives in the attack on the World Trade Center. Alabanza. Praise the cook with a shaven head and a tattoo on his shoulder that said, Oye, 
A blue-eyed Puerto Rican with people from Fajardo, the harbor of pirates centuries ago. Praise the lighthouse in Fajardo, candle glimmering white to worship the dark saint of the sea, Alavanza. Praise the cook's yellow pirate's cap, worn in the name of Roberto Clemente, his plane that flamed into the ocean loaded with cans for Nicaragua, for all the mouths chewing the ash of earthquakes, Alavanza. Praise the kitchen radio dial clicked even before the dial on the oven so that music and Spanish rose before bread. Praise the bread, alabanza. Praise Manhattan from 107 flights up like Atlantis glimpsed through the windows of an ancient aquarium. Praise the great windows where immigrants from the kitchen could squint and almost see their world, hear the chant of nations. Ecuador, Mexico, República Dominicana, Haiti, Yemen, Ghana, Bangladesh, Alabanza. Praise the kitchen in the morning where the gas burned blue on every stove and exhaust fans fired their diminutive propellers, hands cracked eggs with quick thumbs or sliced open cartons to build an altar of cans, Alabanza. Praise the busboy's music, the chime chime of his dishes and silverware in the tub, alabanza. Praise the dish dog, the dishwasher who worked that morning because another dishwasher could not stop coughing or because he needed overtime to pile the sacks of rice and beans for a family floating away on some Caribbean island plagued by frogs, alabanza. Praise the waitress who heard the radio in the kitchen and sang to herself about a man gone, alabanza. After the thunder, wilder than thunder, after the shudder deep in the glass of the great windows, after the radio stopped singing like a tree full of terrified frogs, after night burst the dam of day and flooded the kitchen, for a time the stoves glowed in darkness like the lighthouse in Fajardo, like a cook's soul. Soul, I say, even if the dead cannot tell us about the bristles of God's beard because God has no face. Soul, I say, to name the smoke beams flung in constellations across the night sky of this city and cities to come. Alavanza, I say, even if God has no face. Alavanza. When the war began, from Manhattan and Kabul, two constellations of smoke rose and drifted to each other, mingling in icy air, and one said with an Afghan tongue, Teach me to dance. We have no music here. And the other said with a Spanish tongue, I will teach you. Music is all we have. And here we are, 17 years later. Um, and as I said, the meaning of that poem has changed because of everything we're dealing with today. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, a great deal of new material tonight. About half of the reading will be new poems. Um, and much of it reacting to what's going on in the world around us in this country. Some of you know my Boston connection. I actually lived here for 11 years. Um, between 1982 and 1993, I went to Northeastern University Law School uh, in Boston, got a degree in 1985, and uh, practiced for a number of years in uh, Chelsea. Um, I was supervisor of a program called Su Clinica Legal. So Clinica Legal uh, was a legal services program for low-income Spanish-speaking tenants in Chelsea, and you all know Chelsea, right across um, the Mystic Tobin Bridge um, from Boston. Um, and of course, it's a gateway city, a city of immigrants. It always has been, and it was then. 
Um, so I uh, used to go back and forth taking the 111 bus across the bridge um, from, uh, from Boston into Chelsea uh, to work. And I hated the 111 bus. And so one day I decided I'm going to take a cab. And then all hell broke loose. Uh, as the following poem relates. This poem also relates another incident, and those of you uh, who have lived in Boston for many years will remember the case of Chuck Stewart. This, uh, this poem is called Jumping Off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. I close my eyes and see him windmilling his arms as he plummets from the mystic Tobin Bridge to prove me wrong, to show me he was good, to atone for sins like seeds and the lopsided apple of his heart, but mostly to escape from me in the back of his cab, a Puerto Rican lawyer in a suit and tie. I hated the 111 bus sweltering in my suit and tie with the crowd in the aisle waiting to hit a bump on the mystic Tobin Bridge so my head would finally burst through the ceiling like a giraffe on a circus train. I hated the 111 bus after eviction day in Chelsea District Court translating the landlords and judges into Spanish so the tenants knew they had to stuff their clothing into garbage bags and steal away again, away from the 40 watt squint that followed them everywhere, that followed me because I stood beside them in court. I would daydream in the humidity of the bus, a basketball hero flipping the ball up pages of the law into the wastebasket at the office as the legal aid lawyers chanted my name. I hated the 111 bus. I had to take a taxi cab that day. What the hell are you doing here? said the driver of the cab to me in my suit and tie. You gotta be careful in this neighborhood. There's a lot of Jose's around here. The driver's great-grandfather staggered off a boat so his great-grandson could one day drive me across the Mystic Tobin Bridge, but there was no room in the taxi for chalk on a blackboard. He could hear the sawing of my breath as I leaned into his ear past the bulletproof barricade somehow missing and said, I'm a Jose. I could see the 40-watt squint in his rear-view mirror. I'm Puerto Rican, I said. It was exactly 5 p.m., and we were stuck in traffic in a taxi on the Mystic Tobin Bridge. The driver stammered his own West Side story without the ballet, how a Puerto Rican gang stole his cousin's wallet years ago. You think I'm going to rob you? I said in my suit and tie, close enough now to tickle his ear with the mouth of a revolver. I could hear the sawing of his breath. He still wanted to know what I was doing there. I'm a lawyer. I go to court with all the Jose's, I said. Stalled traffic steamed around us, the breath of cattle in the winter air. Uh, where you going for the holidays, the driver said. I thought about Christmas Eve in court, eviction orders flying from the judge's bench when tenants without legal aid lawyers or children old enough to translate the English of the summons did not answer to their names. Every year, the legal aid lawyers told the joke about the Christmas defense. Your Honor, it's Christmas. I said to the driver, I will be spending Christmas right here with my fellow Jose's. The driver shouted, what do you want me to do? Get out of this cab and jump off the bridge? We both knew what he meant. We both knew about Chuck Stewart, the last man to jump off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. Everybody knew how Chuck drove his wife to Mission Hill after birthing classes, the flash and pop in the dark when he shot her in the head and himself in the belly. 
Everybody knew how he conjured a black car jacker on the crack then called to 911 the way the Mercury Theater of the Air conjured Martians in New Jersey on the radio half a century before. Everybody knew how a hundred cops pounded on door after door in the projects of Mission Hill, locking a black man in a cage for the world to see like the last of his tribe on exhibit at the World's Fair. Everybody knew how Chuck would have escaped, cashing the insurance check to drive away with a new Nissan, but for his brother's confession, the accomplice throwing the Gucci bag with makeup, the wedding rings, and the gun off the dizzy bridge in Revere. Everybody knew how Chuck parked his new car on the lower deck, left a note, and launched himself deep into the black water. How the cops hauled his body from the river by lunchtime when I walked into the office to tell the secretary, Chuck Stewart just jumped off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. I said nothing to the driver. I almost nodded yes in the rearview mirror. I confess. For a flash, I wanted him to jump. The driver, the cops, the landlords, the judges all wanted us to jump off the Mystic Tobin Bridge, all wanted us to sprout gills like movie monsters so we could paddle underwater back to the islands, down into the weeds and mud at the bottom, past the fish plucked rib cages of the dead, the rusty revolvers of a thousand crimes unsolved, the wedding rings of marriages gone bad, till we washed up on shore in a tangle of seaweed gasping for air. Last night, Still more landed here, clothing stuffed in garbage bags to flee the god of hurricanes flinging their houses into the sky or the god of hunger slipping his knife between the ribs. Not a dark tide like the tide of the mystic river, but builders of bridges. You can walk across the bridges they build or you can jump. Was done writing about that. Well, and here we are in the present, and I wonder what my old friend Howard would think. Um, Howard Zinn was a dear friend of mine, and of course most of you know that name. Most of you know about the people's history of the United States. Most of you know about his work as not only a historian, but a great peace activist. And um, I think a lot about Howard these days. When Howard died in 2010, I was uh, called upon to speak at his memorial service in Boston uh, at the Arlington Street Church. And I wrote a poem for the occasion, as I am often called upon to do, and it was okay. But it didn't quite say what I wanted it to say. That took a few years, uh, as, um, as happens sometimes. And then I finally did write the poem I, I wanted to write for Howard. This is a poem about uh, me going to pick him up at his house um, and the two of us going uh, to speak together at an event in Cambridge at the Friends Meeting House um, to protest the bombing of Gaza. Uh, it was one of his last public events. It was the last time I saw him. And um, this is the poem that came out of it. Um, and uh, the, the big secret I reveal in this poem is that Howard was a big baseball fan and the baseball in the poem really did exist. Uh, this is a poem called uh, Castles for the Laborers and Ball Games on the Radio for Howard Zinn, 1922 to 2010. We stood together at the top of his icy steps without a word for once, squinting at the hill below and the tumble we were about to take 
heads bumping on every step till her bodies rolled into the street. He was older than the bread lines of the Great Depression. Before the war, he labored at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, even organized apprentices, but now there was ice. I outweighed him by a hundred pounds. When my feet began to skid, I would land on him and hear the crunch of his surgically repaired spine. The books I held for him would fly away like doves disobeying an amateur magician. Uh, let's go back in the house, I said. Show me the baseball Sandy Koufax signed to you from one lefty to another. Instead, he picked up a blue plastic bucket of sand, the kind of pale good for building castles at Coney Island, tossed a fist of sand down onto the front sun-frozen concrete and took the first step delicately. Again and again, he would throw a handful of sand in the air like bread for pigeons, then probe with the tip of his shoe for the sandy place on the next step. Sand, then step. Sand, then step. Every time he took a step, I took a step. An apprentice shadow studying the movements of his teacher, the body. This is how I came to dance a soft shoe in size 14 boots, grinding my toes into the gritty spots he left behind on the ice. I was there. I saw him turn the tundra into the beach with a wave of his hand, Coney Island of castles for the laborers of ball games on the radio, showing the way across the ice and down the hill into the street where he spoke to me the last words of the last lesson, you drive. And Howard would be absolutely delighted with his Red Sox, um, who have now won 107 games, having defeated the Orioles 19 to 3 this afternoon. Actually, I think they have defeated the Orioles 107 times this season. <laughs> And um, this next poem is based on, uh, on a trip to Fenway. I live in western Massachusetts, so that is a, a very big deal to go to Fenway Park. Um, even though back when I was a legal aid lawyer and nobody came to see the team, I, I could uh, go a dozen times a year. So. Um, this is a poem called The Socialists in the Crowd, and it's not only about Fenway baseball, it's about language. It's about reclaiming language, which is something poets and activists uh, should all endeavor to do. Uh, one of the benefits, one of the very few benefits that came out of the election um, uh, that brought us uh, Trump was that um, Bernie Sanders reclaimed the word socialist gave it back to us. So it's not a dirty word anymore, um, as much as the Republicans would like it to be. Uh, it's back in the vocabulary, and I do believe it may be here to stay. So here it is. Um, the socialists in the crowd. Fenway Park, Boston, May 2013. A baseball sailing into the crowd makes monsters of us all. Hands claw the air as if to snatch a trophy of war. The enemy's white skull to dangle at the gates of the city is a warning to others. Big-bellied men chase the prey down the steps of the bleachers, hearts grinding like millstones. Drunks tumble onto the field along the third base line. The ball stings, fractures fingers, yet we stretch hands to heaven, groping for a foul pot stuffed with the winning lottery number, a line drive scorched with the face of Jesus on cowhide. 
We are ravenous for the flesh of a baseball, mouths open to tear the stitches and bite into the tough white fruit. We slap the ball away from the catcher's mitt, the left fielder's leap. There are fistfights, there are lawsuits, there are baseballs that escape in the tangle of bodies skipping back onto the field. This afternoon, the ball ricochets off the woman with a beer on one fist and a hard lemonade in the other. Then the man stuck in his popcorn box like a bear with a paw jammed in the honey jar, hopping into the hands of the socialist in my row. She hands the ball to a boy wearing the uniform of the Red Sox cap too big for his head, and he gazes at the red stitches the way he once studied the first caterpillar on his fingertips. I have never caught a ball in the stands at Fenway or the Polo Grounds or that ballpark in Havana. Bad socialist that I am, I would have kept it. The crowd would jeer the socialist who did not stand for the anthem or another sergeant singing God bless America in the seventh inning. Yet within the monster of the crowd grinds the grist mill heart of a socialist. So they clap and whoop when she hands the ball to the boy, then gasp at the boom of the right fielder's body slamming off the wall, waiting for the next ball to come their way, like the winning lottery number or the face of Jesus. So, um, Fenway and baseball make an appearance in the next film, but in a radically different way. This, uh, this next poem, which is new poem, has to do with the first hate crime committed in the name of Donald Trump. And it wasn't committed in Mississippi, and it wasn't committed in Alabama, and it wasn't committed in Arkansas. It was committed here in Boston. It was committed right outside JFK Station on the Red Line. And um, the incident, and also Trump's reaction to the incident, became national news. And just as quickly, faded away. We need to bring it back into high relief. So, um, here's the poem. And the title refers, of course, to our president. Not for him, the fiery lake of the false prophet. Epigraph. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Donald Trump, June 16th, 2015. They woke him up by pissing in his face. He opened his mouth to scream in Spanish, so his mouth became a urinal at the ballpark. Scott and Steve, the leader brothers celebrating a night at Fenway, where the Sox beat the Indians and a rookie named Rodriguez spun the scenes on his changeup to hypnotize the tribe. Later that night, Steve urinated on the door of his cell, and Scott told the cops why they did it. Donald Trump was right. All these illegals need to be deported. He was a Mexican in a sleeping bag outside JFK Station on a night in August, so they called him a wetback and emptied their bladders in his hair. In court, the lawyer spoke his name, Guillermo Rodriguez, immigrant with papers, crop picker in the fields, trader of bottles and cans collected in his cart. Two strangers squashed the cartilage in his nose like a can drained of beer. In dreams, he would remember the shoes digging into his ribcage, a pole raked repeatedly across his cheekbones and upraised knuckles, a high five over his body. Donald Trump was right. 
said Scott. And Trump said, the people that are following me are very passionate. His hands fluttered as he spoke, a demagogue's hands, no blood under the fingernails, no whiff of urine to scrub away. He would orchestrate the chant of build that wall at rally after rally, bellowing till the blood rushed to his face, red as a demagogue in the grip of masturbatory dreams. A tribute to the new conquistador, the wall raised up by Mexican hands, Mexican hair and fingernails bristling in the brick, Mexican and blood swirling in the cement like raspberry syrup on a vanilla sundae. On the Cinco de Mayo, he leered over a taco bowl at Trump Tower. Not for him, the fiery lake of the false prophet reddening his ruddy face. Not for him, the devils of Puritan imagination, shrieking in a foreign tongue and climbing in the window like the immigrant demons he conjures for the crowd. Not even for him, 10,000 years of the leader brothers, streaming a fountain of piss in his face as he sputters forever. For him, hell is a country where the man in a hard hat paving the road to JFK station sees Guillermo and dials 911. Hell is a country where EMTs kneel to wrap a blanket around the shivering shoulders of Guillermo and wipe his face clean. Hell is a country where the nurse at the emergency room hangs a morphine drip for Guillermo so he can go back to sleep. 2,000 miles away, someone leaves a trail of water bottles in the desert for the border crossing of the next Guillermo. We smuggle ourselves across the border of a demagogue's dreams. Confederate generals on horseback tumble one by one into the fiery lake of false prophets, into the fiery lake crumbles the demolished wall. Thousands stand sledgehammers in hand to await the bullhorns and handcuffs await the trembling revolvers. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face interrogates the interrogator. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face is the face of Guillermo. So, um, in these times of hate, I believe that to write a love poem is a political act. And um, indeed, I have been writing love poems lately. Of course, they're political love poems, <laughs> but love poems nonetheless. Um, these next two poems are new poems, and they're uh, about my partner. Her name is Lauren Marie Schmidt. She is uh, a poet, a fiction writer, um, and a, a teacher. Um, and um, when I first met her, um, she was um, teaching adult literacy at a community college in Patterson, New Jersey. She would do that four days a week. On her day off, she would go back into Patterson to teach a poetry workshop at a drug and alcohol rehab center by the name of Ava's Village. And this is when the jokes about sainthood begin. And um, that's really the point of departure, the first line of this poem, um, but um, there was also an incident, something that took place uh, at this uh, drug and alcohol rehab center uh, after one of her workshops, or during one of her workshops, I should say, um, that forms the heart of the poem. Uh, the poem also makes a reference to Pablo Neruda, of course, great poet of Chile, and something that really indeed did happen to him at a reading. So um, this is uh, the first of two love poems for Lauren. Uh, this one is called, That We Will Sing.
I call you a saint, washing dishes at the soup kitchen, tutoring men who cannot write their own names, teaching poetry to the addicts, and I imagine Saint Sebastian, female and voluptuous this time, no arrows this time, white robe slipping to her waist, writhing in ecstasy at the touch of an invisible hand, green eyes cast heavenward, though we know there is no God in Patterson. Yet, in poetry class today, you gave the addicts a poem, and they sang the poem back to you. Lift every voice and sing. And so they did, even the man with one arm. And so their voices became human again, not the baying of wolves to be shot on sight by police after sundown, but church voices, school voices, voices before the needle flooded their bodies and drowned all the songs, all the poems they knew. I imagine Neruda telling the crowd he could not read to them the poem they wanted, the poem that begins, Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche, Tonight I can write the saddest verses, since he did not bring that book with him. How the crowd rose together to chant the poem from memory back to the poet. Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche, the saddest verses. Afterwards, the addicts in a circle of folding chairs rose for you, speaking of God in Patterson to their teacher, the heretic, reaching for your hands as if they could take the spirit in your skin back to the shelter where they sleep tonight, touching you the way I touch you sometimes, not in lust, but in astonishment, telling myself I did not imagine you, that you are here, that we will sing. So um, we now uh, live together in uh, Shutesbury, in one of the hill towns outside Amherst, in Franklin County. And, uh, and Lauren um, teaches at a high school, public high school in Springfield. She commutes about an hour in the morning, gets up in the dark, comes home in the dark. 5.30 in the morning, she gets up, 5.30. In the evening, she gets back. And um, something happened one morning which formed uh, the basis of uh, the next poem. This poem is an obad. It's my first obad. And uh, it's one of those forms I'm comfortable with because it does not require counting syllables or stresses. Um, indeed, as you, um, sure most of you know, an obad only requires the presence of a two lovers parting at dawn. So that indeed is exactly what is happening here, among many other things. Uh, the poem is called Obad with Concussion. And there is an epigraph. Poverty is black ice. Naomi Ajala. You leave me sleeping in the dark. You kiss me and I stir. Fingers in your hair, eyes open, unseeing. You leave me asleep every morning, commuting to the school in the city at sunrise. The landlord's driveway, a muddy creek, ices over hard after the freezing rain clatters all night. Your feet fly up, your head slamming the ground, an eclipse of the sun flooding your eyes. You sleep under the car. No one knows how long you sleep. You awake with a hundred ice picks stabbing your eardrums. You awake, coat and hair soaked, and somehow 
drive to school. You remember to turn left at the Smith and Wesson factory. The other teachers lead you by the elbow to Mercy Hospital. Will you pause when the nurse asks your name? Will you claim your pain level is a four and they slide you into the white coffin of an MRI machine? You hold your breath. They film your brain. Concussion. The word we use for the boxer plunging face first to the canvas after the uppercut blindsided him, not the teacher commuting to school at sunrise in a Subaru Crosstrek. Yet, you would drive, ears hammering as they hammer in the purgatory of the MRI. A week before, Isabella came to you in the classroom and said, Miss, I cannot sleep. Three days, I cannot sleep. Her boyfriend called at 2 a.m. and she did not pick up. At 3 a.m., a single shot to the head put him to sleep and he will sleep forever, his body hidden beneath a car in a parking lot on Maple Street. The cops, the television cameras, the neighbors all gathering at the yellow tape carnival of his corpse. You said to Isabella, take this journal, write it down. You don't have to show me. You don't have to show anyone. On the cover of the journal you bought at the drugstore was the word dream. Isabella sat there in your classroom at your desk, pencil waving in furious circles. By lunchtime, as her friends slapped each other, Isabella slept, head on the desk, face pressed against the pages of the journal. This is why I watch you sleep at 3 a.m. when the sleeping pills fail to quell the strike meeting in my brain. This is why I say to you when you kiss me in my sleep, don't go, don't go, you have to go. So, there's a, a kind of love. And um, this next poem is about another kind of love. Uh, my father, Francisco Luis Espada, Frank Espada, was born in Tuala, Puerto Rico in 1930, came to this country as a boy and died uh, in Pacifica, California in 2014, uh, about four years ago. And uh, he was many things. He was a community organizer, he was a civil rights activist, he was a leader, someone say the leader of the Puerto Rican community in New York City in the 1960s and early 70s, and a community of a million people. But he was best known as a documentary photographer. He was best known as the creator of something called the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, a photo documentary of the Puerto Rican migration across the United States and even back to Puerto Rico. It had never been done before, nothing remotely like it. And many people told him it could not and should not be done. One of them was a celebrated photographer by the name of Cornell Kappa, Frank Kappa's brother, Cornell Kappa. And he said to my father, and I quote, no one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. My father used that statement as motivation. It's one of those scenarios, you know what this is like when you're your parent tells you the same story over and over again, and you have to pretend you've never heard it before. <laughs> so my father would say, Cornel Kappa, huh? Huh? You know what he said to me? You know what he said to me? Huh? 
No, what? <laughs> no one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. Well, uh, my father's work is now included in the collections of the Smithsonian Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, the National Portrait Gallery, and the Library of Congress. And uh, this is a poem about my father as, um, as photographer, as artist, uh, about his uh, mad love for the Puerto Rican community of which he was a part. And the title of the poem is Mad Love. Now, um, the title comes from this wonderful, terrible, ridiculous horror movie from 1934 with Peter Lorre indeed, called Mad Love. It's absolutely awful, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> so that's the, the reference here in the, in the second stanza. And um, the poem also makes reference to a number of my father's photographs, a uh, sort of kaleidoscope of images, including this one. Uh, th that is not my father. People seem to assume that it is, but indeed that's a union organizer. He photographed this man, organized the furniture factories in the Bay Area in the 1930s. Um, his name was Elmiro Huertas. Um, and the poem again is called Mad Love. It's got an epigraph. I'll bet you can guess what it is. No one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. Cornell Cap. My brother said they harvested his corneas. I imagine the tweezers lifting the corneas from my father's eyes, delicate as the wings of butterflies mounted under glass. I imagine the transplant stitches finer than hair, eyes fluttering awake to the brilliance of an open window. This is not a horror movie. This is not Peter Lorre and Mad Love, the insane and jealous surgeon grafting the hands of a killer onto the forearms of a concert pianist who fumbles with the keys of the piano, flings knives with lethal aim, moonlight sonata swept away by lust for homicide, his wife shrieking. The blind will see, like the captain of the slave ship who turned the ship around. Voices in the room will praise the Lord for the miracle. Yet the eyes drinking light through my father's eyes will not see the faces in the lens of his camera, faces of the faceless waking in the dark room. Not the tomato picker with a picket sign on his shoulder that says Reagan steals from the poor and gives to the rich. Not the fry cook in his fedora staring at air as if he knew he would be stomped to death on the stoop for an empty wallet. Not the poet in a beret grinning at the vision of shoes for all the shoeless people on the earth. Not the dancer hearing the piano tell her to spin and spin again. Not the grave digger and his machete, the bandana that keeps the dust of the dead from coating his tongue. Not the union organizer spirits floating in the smoke of his victory cigar. Not the addict in rehab gazing at herself like a fortune teller gazing at the cards. Not the face half hidden by the star in the Puerto Rican flag, the darkness of his dissidence eye. Now that my father cannot speak, they wait their turn to testify in his defense, witnesses to the mad love that drove him to it. Thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm going to finish my reading with this poem, um, which also involves my father. And, and then um, this will be out in the, in the lobby uh, there uh, signing books. Porter Square Books is here tonight. Um, 
please come and say hello. And, uh, and thank you all for being here and for listening tonight. This is uh, also um, a new poem. It came out in the March issue of Poetry Magazine. And um, it's addressed to my father. And it's about um, the aftermath of Hurricane Maria on the island of Puerto Rico. Now, I mentioned before that we were going to start with an anniversary and finish with an anniversary. We began with 9-11 and we're ending with 9-20 because it was on the 20th of September, a year ago, that Hurricane Maria struck the island of Puerto Rico and devastated the island. And it wasn't long after that before another hurricane by the name of Trump uh, devastated the island. If you were uh, watching television or online uh, reports from the island, you were seeing a mountain town called Utual. If you were reading articles or essays about what was happening there, you were reading about this mountain town called Utual. Uh, John Lee Anderson in The New Yorker uh, said that Utualo had become, his words, a byword for the island's devastation. My father was born in Utualo. My grandmother was born in Utualo. My great-grandfather was the mayor of Utualo. So Utualo is um, the cradle of the family. And it was devastating to me to see it there over and over and over and over again. And I began talking to my father about it. Um, and of course, he's four years dead. Not that unusual to talk to the dead, I know, especially when you may be in possession of their corporeal remains, as I am, namely his ashes. Um, and that was um, the way this poem came about. Uh, me talking to him about his hometown. Um, and uh, all the uh, quotes from my father in this poem are things he actually said. He had a certain way of talking, uh, larger than life. And uh, I'm glad I had a chance to talk to him about what was going on there. And I have a chance to talk to you now as once again they have revised the death toll and it's no longer 16 and it's no longer 64 and they're talking about 3,000 even though there was a Harvard study uh, uh, estimating a death toll of 4,600 which is far closer to the actual truth. This poem is called Letter to My Father, October 2017 and I'll finish with this. You once said, my reward for this life will be a thousand pounds of dirt shoveled in my face. You were wrong. You are seven pounds of ashes in a box, a Puerto Rican flag wrapped around you next to a red brick from the house in Tualo where you were born, all crammed together on my bookshelf. You taught me there is no God, no life after this life, so I know you are not watching me type this letter over my shoulder. When I was a boy, you were God. I watched from the seventh floor of the projects as you walked down into the street to stop a public execution. A big man caught a small man stealing his car, and everyone in Brooklyn heard the car alarm wail of the condemned. He's killing me! At a word from you, the executioner's hand slipped from the hair of the thief. The kid was high was all you said when you came back to us. When I was a boy and you were God, we flew to Puerto Rico. You said, my grandfather was the mayor of Utuado. His name was Buenaventura. That means good fortune. 
I believed in your grandfather's name. I heard the tree frogs chanting to each other all night. I saw banana leaf and elephant palm sprouting from the mountain's belly. I gnawed the mango's pit and the sweet yellow hair stuck between my teeth. I said to you, you came from another planet. How did you do it? You said, every morning, just before I woke up, I saw the mountains. Every morning, I see the mountains. In Utuado, three sisters, all in their 70s, all bedridden, all Pentecostales, who only left the house for church, lay sleeping on mattresses spread across the floor when the hurricane gutted the mountain the way a butcher slices open a dangled pig and a rolling wall of mud buried them, leaving the fourth sister to stagger into the street, screaming like an unheeded prophet about the end of the world. And Utwalo, a man who cultivated a garden of aguacate and carambola, feeding the avocado and star fruit to his nieces from New York, saw the trees in his garden beheaded all at once like the soldiers of a beaten army, and so hanged himself. Utuado, a welder and a handyman, rigged a pulley with a shopping cart to ferry rice and beans across the river where the bridge collapsed, witnessed the cart swaying about so many hands that raised a sign that told the helicopters, Campamento dos Olvidados, Camp of the Forgotten. Los Olvidados, wait seven hours in line for a government meal of skittles and vienna sausage or a tart to cover the bones of a house with no roof as the fungus grows on their skin from sleeping on mattresses drenched with the spit of the hurricane they drink the brown water waiting for microscopic monsters in their bellies to visit legs upon them. A nurse says, these people are going to have an epidemic. These people are going to die. The president flips rolls of paper towels to a crowd at a church in Wainau, Zeus lobbing thunderbolts on the locked ward of his delusions. Down the block, cousin Ricardo, Bernice's boy, says that somebody stole his can of diesel. I heard somebody ask you once what Puerto Rico needed to be free, and you said, Tres pulgadas de sangre en la calle. Three inches of blood in the street. Now, three inches of mud flow through the streets of Utuado, and troops patrol the town as if guarding the vein of copper in the ground, as if a shovel digging graves in the backyard might strike the ore below, as if La Brigada swinging machetes to clear the road might remember the last uprising. I know you are not God. I have the proof seven pounds of ashes in a box on my bookshelf. Gods do not die, and yet I want you to be God again. Stride from the crowd to seize the president's arm before another roll of paper towel sails away. Thunder Spanish obscenities in his face. Banish him to a roofless rainstorm in Utuado so he unravels one soaked sheet after another till there is nothing left but his cardboard heart. I promised myself I would stop talking to you, white box of gray grit. You were deaf even before you died. Hear my promise now. I will take you to the mountains where houses lost like ships at sea rise blue and yellow from the mud. I will open my hands. I will scatter your ashes in Utuado. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.